Hello, hello, and welcome, my beauties and bees. Good evening, one and all. This is Cryptic Corner, where we explore the unexplained, the supernatural, the paranormal and hidden, the mysterious, the alien, the accursed, and the forbidden. I'm your host, Miss Bumblebree, and I'm so happy you could join us tonight. Uh, if you want to take part in, in, uh, in these segments live with us every Saturday morning, it starts at 9.30 Central Standard Time. Um, and we open with Cryptic Corner as our very first segment. So if this is something you enjoy, you can come and participate and ask questions in the live chat and give your commentary and voice your opinion on what we're looking at. Uh, we welcome skeptics we welcome believers we welcome everyone uh as long as you stay on topic and you're uh and you and you uh you know mind your p's and q's as far as manners goes uh we welcome you to come explore these ideas with us these cryptic sensations that uh at one point in time in history uh shook the world enough to make a to, uh to hinder or to render a publication some kind of documentation in history about the happenstance and we want to look at it because you know what i've i've been in this uh in this field of cryptozoology um uh, basically since I've, I've been an adult so before i was an adult when i was a kid i was probably even more knowledgeable about some of these cryptids and their folklore but uh yeah, I've expanded that, of course, to in, uh, encompass all of uh, all of the 14 topics that people tend to uh, discuss in the corners of the internet. Why is my chat box always in sepia now? Hold on. Let me see if I can turn that off. I don't know why. No, that's too bright. That's too bright. Let's go with... I got a few different settings I can put my chat box in, but I don't know why I didn't mean to just drop it in sepia. Let's see what the cell shade look like. Yeah, I like that. That works. That works for cryptic corner at least. That blue really stands out good against the purple. So, yep. A lot of my show is purple, purple and yellow, purple, purple and gold, uh, and uh, with some bright green accents is generally what cryptic corner goes with. So let me know if you like that. I could try to switch it to something maybe more green or yellow if I need to. But if it doesn't match well with the color scheme of the channel. I'm such a nerd about colors. I was just talking to uh, someone in the community about doing an intro for them. Uh, using some of my, uh, some of my uh, programs and stuff that I have here to, to edit. And uh, was thinking about their color palette. And, like Everybody should have, uh, you know, at least two main colors and then an accent color for their channel. It really does uh, bring it to the forefront. The two main colors, uh, mine are really contrasting because I'm, blah, 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 but they can blend really good like a, hold on, let me clear my throat. Like a dark, uh, like a dark uh, blue and a dark purple or something that blends really good like this does. Um, anyhow, let's get back and let's get to the topic uh so because when it comes to uh being ah, i used to be when i was younger even even more i was like into like witchcraft and new age stuff and one of the things that always fascinated with me was these were these old ointments that uh, witches supposedly used to make you know these uh flying ointments that they would brew up in their in their cauldrons uh they do other things besides flying. There'd be stuff for uh, lycanthropy uh, to help you transform into a werewolf, uh, hallucinogenic ointments uh, used by witches. Uh, they always had some like like creepy ingredient, like oh, that the the base has to be a uh, the fat of a hangman, or uh, you have to use a, use blood as a binder, uh, blood of a hangman. Uh, uh, blood of a, a unbaptized child, weird shit like that. But when you look back into the grimoires, they didn't actually actually include those. What they included, I mean, there's no real. They didn't really use eye of newt and and stuff. There were certain animals that they did extract certain chemical compounds from. Um, the people that herbalists and 
medicine workers uh, long before modern medicine. People were still trying to figure this shit out. They just weren't as good at it as we are now. There were good people trying to do good work, just trying to make good decisions, medical decisions for their patients using these substances. And the ones that we see here are included on there. Now, I don't usually talk too much about plants on this, unless it's like a man eating plant or something. And maybe that's to my own uh, detriment, because it's a fascinating topic, and there's so many magical plants uh, that have metaphysical abilities, according to folklore, that we can actually link directly to their narcotic abilities. Which is funny, because the people... It's the same class of people, the same grade of people that are saying, like, the, I'm talking about the spiritual leaders, right? That are saying that uh, that the spirit and the soul is real. That said that these would say that these cause mystical experiences, right? But we know it's chemical compound reactions in our uh, chemistry, brain, and uh, electro responses in our brain. So, but one uh, ingredient, I, I mean, I could I could go over each one of these ingredients. See, like this, like this. I'm talking about fat, fat of a child and stuff like that. It's human fat, uh, dig out of a grave. Uh, juice of smallage, wolfbane, things like that are... Uh, that's Francis Bacon. I mean, that's like not like a nobody saying that. Um, claiming that they did, that, that they used human fat and stuff like that. But the, the plants, like what I'm talking about, like belladonna... Jimson weed, uh, henbane, wolfsbane, hemlock. I also mean scopolamine. These these plants are uh, toxic, and we know they have toxic um, they have toxic compounds in them. You know, uh, but when it comes to these ointments, one thing's always. Uh, always fascinated me and that was this one right here it's called the mandrake right now the mandrake has a sordid history uh with medicine right as a general rule we don't normally give gardening advice on the medieval manuscripts blog this is from the medieval manuscripts blog so they talk about uh, kind of uh bestiaries and uh horticulture stuff but this is their segment on the history of the mandrake because there's a lot of folklore about this that's kind of funny and weird and it's really it's really uh, distorted by modern fiction like uh, Harry Potter because people don't even realize it's a real thing they think it's like a fictional organism like a dragon or a griffin um, but it's not as an actual plant mandragora uh, but let's read on. It's just possible, however, that you may have been contemplating the best way to harvest a mandrake. And so here we provide you with some handy tips on cultivating the most notorious of plants based on manuscripts in the British Library collections. A cure for insanity. Yeah, so if you're insane, this is supposed to cure your insanity. Now remember what we said about the chemical compositions of these things being compared to psychotropic substances? In the Middle Ages, it was believed that mandrakes, mandragora, could cure headaches, earaches, gout, and insanity. At the same time, it was supposed that this plant was particularly har hazardous to harvest. Hazardous to harvest. That's a good uh, tagline for this for the stream. Hazardous to harvest because its roots resemble the human form. When pulled from the ground, it shrieks. Could be could cause madness so it cures insanity and it has the compounds in it to cure insanity but scream that it emits when you pull it from the ground that now that is hazardous to your health the root of a mandrake carved to resemble a tiny human loaned from the science museum of a british the uh, british library exhibition harry potter the history of magic yeah let's look at this so this is uh this is the root of mandrake, as you can see. This one looks like a person kneeling with their hands in front of them. Um, and they appear to be holding something. Interesting. 
identifying your mandrake. You would think that this was simple, but it was long believed that there were two different sexes of mandrake, which we have always been tempted to call the mandrake and the woman drake. Uh, this beautiful 14th century manuscript was on show in the British Library's Harry Potter, A History of Magic Exhibition. It contains an Arabic version of De Materia Medica, or originally written in ancient Greek by uh, Pendanius uh, Dioscorides, who's, who worked as a physician in the Roman army. Uh, Dis Dio... That's D I would I just want to call him Dio. <laughs> Dio, can you hear me? I'm lost and all alone. Uh, Dio Scorides. Dio Scorides, I think is how it's said. Dio Scorides. That's a cool name. Was one of the first authors to distinguish mistakenly between the male and female mandrake as depicted here. In fact, there is more than one species of mandrake native to the Mediterranean rather than two sexes of the same plant. So they're showing uh, differences alleged between the male and female, but really it's just two different species of the same, uh, of the same genus of the plant. This man, the mandrake, uh, on the other hand, is quite clearly um, male as a, as the species. So you can see his you can see his drake. Here's, here's the man right here. And here's the drake down here. That's the man drake. That's how that works. This one's showing the fruit. These are the fruit, not the flower. This is what the flowers look like. Below are two man drakes, one male and one female, drawn in the lower margins of the Queen Mary Salters hanging upside down. Their blood is clearly rushing to their heads. Yeah, this is down, draw, just drawn down here. They used to just do that, just draw like some cartoons in the, uh, in the margin. That's actually where kind of the history of cartoons comes from is these little drawings that monks would put in the corners of the manuscripts because, uh, they'd used to, uh, tight, this is medieval margining right here. This is the kind of margins that they put. And I think this is, I want to say this is Latin. Looks like Latin. It's not Greek. Um... But yeah, so they would have all these extra extra margin space on their pages. So they'd use them to draw this or they'd draw rabbits uh, doing bad things to each other. It is also advisable not to confuse your mandrake with a gonk. With an elephant. Yes, they are elephants. Or with a dragon. <laughs> Got a mandrake here showing what the gonks look like and what the dragons look like. Mandrake, gonk, dragons. And I guess gonks work pretty, uh, that'd be fun. Could you imagine if we called elephants gonks today? It's like a short word. It's like gonk. Yeah, it's a gonk. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, uh, no one wants, like, because we have lots of expressions that use the word elephant. Like, no one wants to talk about the gonk in the room. Uh, do you want to do a, a white gonk Christmas exchange? No one says, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, elephant's kind of a long word. I mean, no one complains about it. Like, like with the other two big mammals, hippopotamus and rhinoceros are equally long names. They're just like, oh yeah, it's a big animal. It's a big long name. But for hippopotamus and um, rhinoceros, we have shortened versions of their names that we use in common parlance, right? We say hippo or rhino. No one says Ellie or Fant. No one says either one of those. We need to bring Gonk back. So, you know, the biggest animals in Africa, the biggest animals, the biggest land animals in the world would go gonk, rhino, hippo, right? And, and, and forget about uh, the, the long names when you're just listing them off in common parla parlance. Yes, let's gonk it up. I want to see more gonk references in my, um, in my side chat, please. Uh, think of uh, terms that are phrases that we use that have elephant in them. 
and then ch exchange it for gonk. I want to see how it sounds. We're going to test this baby out. But I'm going to continue on reading about mandrakes because it's easy for anybody to get distracted by gonks when you when you really uh, dig in. <clears throat> All right, so the next part is going to get a little bit gruesome. Um, for my for my dog lovers, I'm very sorry to tell you about this part of mandrake history. This is not something I'm happy to be reporting on, but I will explain how you harvest a mandrake. First of all, you got to bring a dog, okay? Medieval plant collectors uh, devised an elaborate method to harvest a mandrake. The best way to obtain one safely was to unearth its roots with an ivory stake, attaching the plant to a dog with a cord. A horn sound should be sounded, drowning out the shrieking, while at the same time startling the dog, causing it to drag out the mandrake. This medieval mandrake looks resigned to its fate. As he's talking about this one down here. See the dog tied to its feet. The dog dies in this, yeah. While the mandrake is blushing with shame at the prospect of being pulled out of the ground. Because everybody can see his drake. This one didn't show up. It's an older picture. See if I can get to load. No, this is another going to be another picture of the dog dragging the guy out. Or dragging the, yeah, dragging the mandrake out. The Anglo-Saxon hound was yet to be tied to the mandrake. Is that a ball that has distracted its attention? Like, yeah, it does look kind of like they have a ball in the middle of this, in the middle of the subtext too. Like somebody threw a ball across the margins. Did they throw a ball? Did they throw a ball to get this doggy to pull the, the dog's tethered? They say it's failed to be, it's not tethered yet. I see a tether around the dog's back ankle from Mandrake to the dog right there. I see it. Someone tied this dog to the Mandrake and threw a ball. Uh, humans are awful. I swear that dog just wanted to play. Mm -hmm. Sleep like a lion, wake up like a gonk. The gonk's graveyard. Yeah, you can explore the gonk's graveyard. Mm -hmm. I've seen a peanut stand. I've heard a rubber band. Seen a needle wink its eye. I thought I seen about everything when I saw a gonk fly. Oh, laying down some Dumbo uh, ring, bringing out the big guns. <laughs> I love a good deep fried gonk ear in the at the fair. Yeah, I like I want to get some uh, gonk ears to put by my window so like people walk by it looks all green and healthy in here. That makes me feel good about myself when that happens. I let all my plants die from frostbite. I'm such a bad plant plant mom. I didn't even think about because um, we're on a screened in porch. I thought oh they let them enjoy the sunlight until the first snow. Nope. They didn't keep them above the frost line. Anyway, enough of me complaining about my um, temporary black thumb. Because I assure you, I do most of the time have a pretty green thumb. Once I'm, when I'm not uh, not so down in the dumps uh, so much. But life's getting better. Getting better all the time. Going to be uh, going to a Christmas party after this. So, yeah. Let me see here. Stuff your ears with earth. Yuck. No, do never stuff your ears with earth. There's, this is not good advice for anybody at any point in time to stuff earth in your ears. It does not matter. Cotton balls, uh, earplugs. Uh, ear, I would suggest like you just using your earbuds, right? And then sticking those in there and then playing some music. If you're going to be digging mandrakes up, okay? Dude, we're going to update this to the... Because it's 2023, not 1562 or whenever this was written. Another trick was to stuff your ears with clods of earth before attempting to pull the mandrake from the ground. The gentleman in the red cap below has done exactly this and is blowing resoundingly upon the horn. Perfect technique. He's getting it. Uh, I wonder if the horn sounds like a elk bellowing or maybe like a gonk trumpeting. We're gonna gonk's gonna be a thing on my channel now, right? 
just uh, perfect uh, mandrake harvesting technique. Look at this because they're saying it's a perfect technique. So we need to keep in mind what we're seeing here. So I don't have, what do I have? Hold on. I have a... Uh... I have a giant stack of folk instruments, but I have some, a flute. Can I, can I drown it out with a flute? Not a flute. This is a tin whistle. Pull it. Sound the horn. Nothing. Yeah. I'm not going to sit here and play all day. Uh, we need to get through this so that we can figure out how to harvest mandrake properly. Oh, that's it. That's it. They don't tell us about the dog. You cowards! You have to tell us what happens to this dog. We see this dog here, right? See him? Tethered to the man. There's the man. There's the drake. The dog's tethered there. And they're, they, whoever whoever's writing this blog just decided not to. Not to tell us what happens here. What happens next. It's an old Geller kind of thing. Except for this dog doesn't have rabies. It's a, where the red fern grows. Except for it's where the dog killing mandrake grows instead. You understand what I'm talking about? So why? Why won't you, why won't you disclose the dark truth? Let's see if sacred geometry will disclose the dark truth to us. I am going to speed this up because we're already well into the time slot, so. Something else, and so instead of including it. All right, here we go. OS3D, sacred geometry decoded. And I've been preparing something else, and so instead of including it in the, uh, this series, I'm going to just put it separately in. Focus on De Materia Medica by uh, mm -hmm. Pedanius Dioscorides. Very uh, first century Greek slash Roman era uh, medicine herbal book, and it's been published throughout time for many centuries so from the earliest edition up until the middle ages it was still pretty much the standard textbook to do with herbs and medicines and uh, even up until the 19th century it was still hey nj uh enjoy your uh enjoy your doctor who when that starts i don't like the way he's looking at the dog maybe it's a good thing we don't know yeah oh no what if they use john wick's dog to pull up a mandrake that would be a different way to start the start the series very important and uh, he's like a later version translation and one of the more older ones we can see it's written in the greek and the focus of this video will be what you see there and those are mandrakes or mandragora, mandragora. uh the the materia medica this is the um juliana anasia codex or the vienna the as they call it from approximately 15 15 sorry 515 ad and this is one of the earliest illustrated herbal books very important and because of the age as well and it will relate to someone drew these pictures in 515 isn't that gorgeous? Look how uh, it's almost re like realistic. You, I mean, you think about how bright they probably were when they were first laid down in ink, right? And if they're, they're faded now, how bright and beautiful these must have been in their glory. Well, the series I'm going to be posting in regards to some of these things now, the, no, not just for, uh, we'll get to that, but just even the, the style of the illustrations is pretty cool in that particular one. These are Arabic translations. This uh, De Materia Medica was very important, widespread um, text in regards to herbs and medicines. But medicines also include minerals and metals as well. So it was not strictly purely a herbal book. It was a medicine book. So the mm -hmm. 1554 edition, but here we see from the um, Juliana Sia Codex, this surviving illustration, and that's important because it's related to Mandrake. And you might notice that there is a dog hanging from underneath. Yeah. So here we see Dioscar. The There's a dog hanging from underneath, right? We all know what happened to him. We know what, they, what, these, what, these, men, what these gentlemen did to that dog. It was I'm wanting a 515 version, 1580 version of John Wick to come in here and uh, and deal with them. Garidi's receiving um, a mandrake, and this mandrake being so important as a ancient medicine for and also related to medieval witchcraft, these other elements. It's just, it's still very very strongly connected with magic. So as far as herbs and plants go, mandrake is the magic one of uh, back to antiquity. One of the reasons is because it looks like a homunculus, like a, a little person. So in um, Elias Levi, that famous... If film, you haven't watched the uh, there's the video on homunculus, I'm probably at my premiere. I'm going to drop the link over... Oh, actually, be up there. Um, No. It'd be in the side chat, so it'd be over there. Yeah. 
for my homunculus video where I covered that. Very similar kind of concept, actually, to a mandrake. Image of Baphomet. In his book, he also speaks of the mandrake connects it to Paracelsus and the concept of a homunculus, which is a miniature man. In alchemy, such as uh, by Geber, they speak one of the, the aims, ambitions of alchemists were to create artificial life, and that was to create a homunculus, a miniature man, and, that, and well, he's heard having magical properties because the actual properties of it are very unique, but uh, also it, it looks magical in that sense. So Mandrake is a hallucinogenic, it's a trip, okay, and it's a narcotic. Narcotic comes from the Greek word narco, which means to make numb. In the Oscar Reedes, he describes how a wine made from an Mandrake produces anesthesia. So it's one of the earliest references to anesthesia, anesthetics, and the original translation of that should mean a loss of sensation. So bats, so uh, early physicians such as Galen, who were, uh, and uh, there was a lot of battle going on in those times, there were a lot of wounds, you can see in for instance, the Edwin Smith papyrus of ancient Egypt, they talk about trauma injuries. So they use mandrake as an anesthetic, and like historically. But the, the need of an anesthetic would be an important one, and mandrake is an anesthetic, it's also hallucinogenic. So enter a Joe Rogan meme there. <laughs> it's also interesting. Sort of, so Joe Rogan. Uh, it's also interesting, a... what I'll be covering in the uh, videos I've planned ahead, is the connection between uh, the Hermetic era, especially. See, so this is the Voynich manuscript, you know? What the Voynich manuscript is. The Voynich manuscript is kind of famous. It's this book. <clears throat> Man, it deserves its own episode. It's this ancient book, right? That uh, that had uh, that had all these uh, herbology. There's like whole sections of herbology and astrology, but the the text itself was written in a language that no one has ever heard of or seen. No one knows quite what to make of it. It's really uh, and it's it's bizarre because it does you can see it has mandrake and stuff like that in it uh mandrake is a uh mandragora officium is a plant from okay that's just uh we've, we've gone over that satan's apples are what his berries are called they're orange they're about that big though they're not tiny they're, they're pretty big size they're still just a slightly smaller than a golf ball uh, with people such as um, Aponasus Kirscher, connections to the Voynich manuscript, connections to Apocryphy, and how this goes back in time and back to the early Greek period and the influence of the Babylonians. Chaldeans. Now, the mandrake is a plant that does appear in the Bible, right? This is a biblical plant. Like, uh, you can, uh, th they'll get to it in a second here, but this is a, uh, the folklore surrounding this plant does uh, appear in the in the Bible, too. Um, and the ancient Egyptians on these. Now, there's not many texts left from the ancient past, but through Dioscorides, and those few surviving fragments from Mesopotamia and Egypt, you can see this connection. But that's an illustration from the Voynich manuscript. Now, no one's cracked the code of the language. Uh, however, and I'll cover this um, in more detail soon, but the illustrations are mostly herbal. Then there's a small section on astronomy or uh, astrology. And then there's uh, several pages which show apothecary jars connected to a particular plant. So a herb would be stored in a particular shape, jar of it made of, whether it be glass or a ceramic jar, which blends with the apocryphy medical texts of earlier up until the Middle Ages through to the Renaissance. So there's a mandrake connection and they are using the roots as an anesthetic. Mandrakes are mentioned in the Bible, Old Testament, for instance. There we go, yeah. Uh, pay for play, I suppose. So. so the mandrake, the roots themselves and the berries um, are said to pack hallucinogenic properties. I believe it's the berries that, uh, that, people, uh, that people trip on, but I'm not sure. Um, if there are people who do eat the roots too, I think most people keep the roots as like a charm more so than as a, taking it as a narcotic. So the berries can be narcotic, but the plant itself is like a charm to have. You, you can have it in your, um, in your garden or you can have it in a pot in your domicile or whatever, but it's a, it's uh, a charm that's supposed to give you certain prosperities as opposed to the berries, which have a very real psychotropic effect. Um, and they can be used. Uh, they did. These are what people used to use for anesthetics way back in the day. Uh, Ruben found some mandrakes and then he uh, bribed Rachel. And I'm not sure if I can say that, know that word, but uh, the oldest profession connected to mandrakes in the uh, Old Testament. It's also in the Songs of Song of Solomon, number seven. Also interesting the connection in regards to uh, wine and grapes, and because mandrake would be uh, usually would be often blended with wine as one of the ways of serving it. Mandrake the magician was a uh, popular cartoon back at the time, and you might recognise this image from recent movies. He's an older image. What, what's Mandrake the magician? I don't know what that is. Here's the witch raising her, raising up her little mandrake. Of a witch with uh, mandrake. 
and flying which is now I include that both here because you also see the Strix or Stavigo as we call it in, um, because as we said at the beginning of the stream there's a connection between mandrakes and flying ointment so my goal for for being able to get to fly is gonna I'm gonna give you a mandrake first so that's that's on the agenda now right we know that's something that we need the old language uh, old country where my parents originate witchcraft as well and very important in witchcraft so witches flying ointments contain mandrake but also include a uh, deadly nightshade and a few other poisons that's how the uh, during the, the witch hunting period and that type well mandrakes were very magical also uh, if you harvested a mandrake it would often said you'd go to hell so there, there was a lot of hey if you have a mandrake at all in your possession um you're a witch and will burn you but yeah, but you, doctors needed this to put people into uh, uh, into a sleep so they could operate on them. They, they didn't have anesthesia back then. This was what this was the anesthesia of Middle Age Europe, and they're like, ah, oh, but if you have anesthesia, you're a witch, and we're gonna burn you. This is like what's happening now with the that with a certain vaccination, right? You got these. Uh, this, this uh, treatment that, that the public needs in order to be able to uh, have a lower mortality rate, yet uh, there's a, a faction of a political faction, a political movement in our country to, uh, to prosecute <laughs> for, uh, for uh, putting out these vaccines. Uh, Mandrake potions for the Sabbath and um, back in Ireland. Bacchanalians, uh, Bacchus, as they call them, ceremonies of drunkenness and debauchery, those typical images of witchcraft from back in the day. Here we see some mandrake roots, and you can see the, you know, not always, so if you can get a, so just like in China now, if you get a ginseng root that looks like a human, it has huge more value than one that just looks rather random. So I'm Yeah, you see that they don't always turn out that way. It, what it is, like a double tap root is what it is. You said you got two big tap roots going down, and these aren't nearly as long as they actually are. They go down to a good five feet. But they, you know, they get thinner, but they're still a big tap root. It's like a big drinking straw for the, uh, for the plant. A mandrake root was valuable. A mandrake root that looked like a human was very, very valuable. So old editions of um, Dioscorides, De Materia Medica, you can see, and also the um, later. See, this one probably used to be quite vibrant and beautiful, too. I bet these berries were bright yellow. The yellow inks just uh, faded out. You've got, uh, and this, this is probably a, actually a lighter... Uh, brown with lines on it, but the, the ink they use for the lines just kind of bled together over the centuries. So something like this, you know, because you can kind of see it, and they, I don't know if it's conveying to you guys, you can kind of see like a, a stripiness to it. Arabic from Spain, uh, but the connections between mandrake as a male and a female plant, depending on the shape, so they would have different aspects. So even in, uh, what is it, um, Hortus sanitia, that's the name of the text, but uh, again, mandrakes as being either a male or a female form. One that looked human, valuable. If you could mm -hmm. separate uh, one that looked particularly male or one that looked particularly female, would have its own applications and again increase this, uh, the value of the plant. Uh, in regards to separating herbs, so Dioscorides and other ancient writers, uh, Pliny, uh, Theocrasus, separated herbs into a male or a female aspect and gem. Yeah, so that, I mean, j separating gems into male and female. Hmm. Still now, uh, dark rubies are considered male, lighter gems are female. According to Josephus and other ancient writers, a darker mandrake would be more feminine and a white mandrake would be considered more male. But in alchemy, herbal, apoc apocryphy, this division between uh, male and female aspects is an important one. Because for instance, in this is uh, the work of Isaac Newton, um, one of his during his alchemical period. And you can see the symbols, for instance, uh, Mercury, the Moon, Mars, the Sun and Venus, which were connected to particular metals as well as gods such as Aphrodite or Venus. But he also separates them into masculine and female. So masculina sanguina. Uh, so you also have the four uh, humans, but femina, 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 masculine, Not right. masculine, masculine, and the way to separate them and divide and this class them. So, but weird old ancient classification of things with feminine and masculine that we still hang on to today, even though it's shown to be just uh, a social construct of, the, the, of Western Europeans. We still cling to it today because there has to be, right? There has to be these divisions whatever for most people probably have seen the harry potter movies and the screaming mandrake where they well the thing was screaming this concept of the screaming mandrake has uh, ancient origins and the dangers of a screaming mandrake if it's improperly harvested again i 
if you don't harvest, as the legend goes, of course, this is not, you know, not in real life, but if you don't harvest a mandrake properly, it will scream and it would either drive you mad or kill you, as, as the saying goes. And this will be something yeah. I'll be covering in these upcoming videos in regards to um, even, for instance, frankincense they were, um, and these other very valuable um, medicinal incense herbs that usually had some sort of psychoactive substance. Yeah, and frankincense one of the things they brought to baby Jesus and then they did grew up thinking he was God. Connection? Hmm very often uh, a legend connected to it of its danger if improperly harvested or used and seems to be like to scare the people off um, in a sense it's very it's uh, seems to be more the exception than the rule that mandrake and these other plants have some scary legend attached to them so back in uh, from the Juliana Anasia codex and you see the Oscar Reeves receiving the mandrake we also notice the dog bear underneath bad Here are various in poor dog uh, we know what you did which is uh, well throughout time um, and periods where we see again the mandrake connected to a dog and this one you can see how he's only partially harvested and again here and the, you can see the rope tied between the dog and the mandrake again the mandrake and the dog are connected and here as well you can see that the dog is connected to the mandrake if the mandrake is dangerous so the you can see in these uh, arabian images from uh, in regards to the mandrake and the dog and again here and notice that this guy is covering his ears because the concept was that you would partially dig out the man mandrake root but if once you ripped it out it would scream and that would either send you mad or kill you so what the idea was you would partially dig it out then you would attach it to a starving dog you would throw a piece of meat, the dog would chase the meat, the dog would pull the mandrake out, and thus the dog would die from harvesting the mandrake, not the person. No! Uh, Josephus and other ancient texts. Uh, so, Leave those dogs alone! Um, more of a medieval uh, period speaks about that this has ancient origins, and it's again eh. across the Mediterranean region that this tradition, this legend, is being passed on. Mandrakes grow in um, current day Israel, uh, were. Uh, native there uh, is evidence to suggest that Tutmosis, uh, along with many other plants that he imported from this region brought mandrakes into egypt maybe they might have been there already but uh, definitely amongst many other plants Tutmosis, after a victorious campaign in syria imported a lot of medicinal plants and here we can see the mandrake fruit uh, in these glass payons uh, beads part of the pendant there's a yeah. passing mandrake fruits around and you can see in the garden of uh, the um, mandrake there in egypt and there are many papers on this in regards to how mandrake was uh, uh, imported. So this is well known in the ancient uh, ancient Mediterranean area, all the way from the, the uh, ancient Near East uh, to North Africa and uh, in Spain, so just encompassing the Mediterranean region where the plant was uh, pretty abundant. There's species in Northern Europe too, and there's definitely some folklore there, but Nothing has survived. Uh, I actually looked at this uh, this Norse mythology channel, to, uh, their section on uh, Mandrake, but they were pretty adamant that nothing has survived from uh, from the from uh, the pre-Roman era, or not pre-Roman, pre-Christian era of uh, of Mandrake's uh, folklore. Plant used in Egypt, and because again, it's uh, it's an anesthetic, it's hallucinogenic, just like the water lily. Uh, frankincense, uh, of course, cannabis sativa as well, and why these plants were so important and so often found in tombs, etc. So, mandrake, screaming mandrake, connected to a dog to harvest it. It's a very ancient use of this plant, well recorded. Uh, very across awful. The Mediterranean um, region, and still one of those plants that, and the legends connected to it because of well, the actual plant people still using mandrake. Don't don't do it. Be careful what you do it. Yeah, but also how this is passed on in popular uh, fiction as well, and the, the mandrake as well. So, didn't want to, this is we want to include this in the in the history section so just as a separate one-off in regards to looking at mandrakes screaming mandrakes and these legends connected to them so i'll be looking at uh the materia medica and the oscarides and how these other ancient texts were actually if you want to call it the original corpus hermetica and that's why we saw that explosion of science engineering etc not the hermetican but it was actually these other books such as the materia 10 books of architecture etc cheers have a good one so i just subscribed because i thought it was uh interesting but yeah um yeah, this was SGD, Sacred Geometry Decoded, is what we are looking at right there. And then I got one little short video. This is this uh, cult, some occultist guy named Raven Grimasi showing us the wicked way to charge your mandrake. This is the mandrake root that we've unearthed in preparation for replanting. And we like to charge them to inform them magically as to their status as the sorcerer's root so that they remember their past and secure it in the present and carry it into the future as they grow. And here is the call. You are the master at watch in the midnight hour, the sorcerer's root of the witch's power. 
the plant who wanted human form brings plant and witch to covenant sworn. Rooted dweller in the black earth unseen, hidden eyes peering to catch the moon's beam. Leafy crown of stars, the greenwood might, empowers the will through the witch's right. Come to the thorn-blooded witch who hails. I call you to pass through the verdant veils. I reach out from the time-honored power by seed, sprout, budded leaf, and flower. This is from my book, The Grimoire of the Thorn-Blooded Witch. The Thorn-Blooded Witch. So that's how Wiccans do their charging up, uh, magical charging power of, uh, of their, uh, of their mandrake roots. Now, here's just a quick rundown of, uh, the Royal College of Physicians position on Mandragora, Ophensnarium. Uh, there's more than one species of mandrake, so this is just one species, but common name mandrake, devil's apple, devil's candle, uh, Mandragora, distribution, Italy, Yugoslavia, habitat is perennial, hardiness is H5, uh, hardy, cold winter, uh, garden status, currently grown, garden location, Europe, classical Europe mi and Middle East, pharmacopoeia, Ladinensis, 1618, Let's see, poison garden, this is like a few different poison gardens, look at that, um, medicinal uses, <laughs> um, ye juice be drunk, doth expel up with phlegm and black color. But being too much drank, it drives out life. And that there be given of it to such as shall be cut or cauterized, for they do not apprehend the pain, because they are overborn with dead sleep. It is interesting to see the use that the use of hycosine scoplamine has continued for two millennia from the same for the same purpose. Yeah, uh, hycosine, uh, scoplamine, the toxins or compounds that we uh, you, I, I hate calling things toxins. The compounds that that we discussed earlier that are actually present here, and they used to use this uh, extract for the extract of the berries for medicinal purposes. The, this is a member of the family uh, Solonansia, and like Atropa belladonna and Hysychomynus niger, uh, contains the atropic alkaloid hy hyoscine and scoplamine that is still used in, as a pre-medication prior to surgery as it causes sedation, a degree of amnesia, and is anti uh emetic it also produces a dry mouth it's low pulse unlike atropines but in larger doses hallucinations coma and death in the elderly especially it may cause excitement and confusion so it's basically like, it's, it's, it has a lot of reactions a lot like scoplamine and if you're familiar with that with the with the applications of scoplamine um, it's like the, and scoplamine was big, like the big old MK Ultra, uh, a big part of the MK Ultra stuff. So, um, that's what they'd use, uh, to keep the people sedated. Anyway, uh, so that's a little bit of, uh, history of the mandrake and the first ingredient on my list of ingredients to make my flying ointment. Uh, I'm also hoping that I can use the same ointment to achieve lycanthropy. So, I'm going to be a flying wolf and we're going to harvest a mandrake. So I need to get a dog also on the side as a dog walker because I'm going to need to get lots of mandrakes so all my friends can fly with me. I'll fly all over the place. I'll fly out to Baltimore and uh, get Miss Maya, fly down to, uh, what do we got? We got John Hudson down in Texas. I don't know where all you people live. You're all over the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, I'll truckers up in Canada. I could fly to Canada. Wolf's fly, a wolf flying in Canada with my Arctic fur. I'd be just fine. So what do you all think about the mandrake? Do you think that uh, 
that there was maybe some species of mandrake in the past that screamed and cried like a like a banshee when pulled from the ground and maybe it's just extinct now or do you think that this is just folklore uh surrounding it because it has psychotropic properties so they didn't want the children to be messing with the plant you know sort of like the boogeyman in the woods because you don't want your kids going out in the woods because of the actual danger uh but it's easier just to, to uh, encompass that danger into one figure so you say hey be careful with the plants that you uh that you eat and uh and handle in the woods because there's plants that can kill you and they're like oh like what and they're like um yeah there's a plant you pull it up and it screams um and the screams makes your head explode something like that you know just t just folklore to tell your kids to keep them from uh misbehaving Anyway, that was our episode on mandrake, our first ingredient for our flying ointment. Uh, uh, please remember to be kind, take care, and we will see you next time.